Welcome to part four of the 3D printed F1 gearbox project. I wanted to give you all some updates, you know, on the progress that's been made and then focus more on the electronics and the software and the control systems that are being built to actually run this gearbox. First up, reverse is actually working. Um, just to give you some background on an F1 transmission, reverse is really only in there because of the rules and it's very rarely used. It's only expected to last several hundred feet over the entire life of the gearbox. So it's a, it's a pretty weak gear and uh, as such, there really isn't much to it. Um, so as you can see, there's a push rod on this side that's got a spring behind it. And that push rod actually acts on, a little hard to see in there, a collar that the reverse gear is riding on. And that slides on this other shaft here. So that just basically gives it a little offset so it has more clearance. You can see it just slides in and out. And then when it's in place, it actually reverses the direction of the uh, output. If you watch that top shaft there, the output shaft, you'll notice that it's spinning counterclockwise. And then if I actually engage reverse, it will begin to spin in the clockwise direction. In a real F1 car, reverse is actuated with uh, hydraulics and a little piston inside this cylinder housing here. Um, but in my case, I'm gonna go ahead and keep it manually actuated. So I'll have a little push rod that comes out this port here that just presses down on this to manually actuate reverse. Next up, I've got the detents finished and they're working great. So this basically forces the shift barrel into a particular position so it can't get stuck um, kind of in an in-between state between gears. So with the electronics crate, I was able to fit everything inside the clutch slave housing. Um, you can see it's a, a tight fit and I had a lot of issues troubleshooting all this uh, with all the jumper wires, ended up having two bad jumper wires, which uh, took many, many hours to find. Um, but it's in there and I've used some hot glue to kind of hold all the jumpers in. And I really need to learn how to ultimately make a custom PCB, but cover fits nice. I want to go ahead and add a couple extra slots because I think it's going to be nice to be able to take the entire cover off without having to unplug any of the electronics. Um, and I've also got the ESP32 right here with the programming port so that I can access that without having to remove it at all. I was worried a little bit about the motor noise, but that hasn't been a significant issue. I've got most of the high power stuff over here um, in the motor. And so basically this side's all the 12 volt stuff. And then everything over here is gonna be the 3.3 volts. So here on top, I've got the actual shift indicator and I'll flash up a picture of what that looks like all lit up. Um, and then I've got two four digit seven segment displays here on either side um, that I can display different data such as, uh, you know, the RPMs or the speed, um, potentially even the shift times. Um, and then here in the middle, I've actually will have the uh, gear indicator itself. Um, then I'll have a front panel that actually goes on here. that has a couple of buttons that allow me to put it into like learning mode or to toggle through the various um, displays that are up there. Um, powering the whole thing is a nice little, uh, ESP32, um, got that tucked in there. And then as you can see, this is another case that a, a custom PCB would be a, a great solution versus having to actually directly wire all these. So I've got uh, 50 plus wires in here with all the uh, resistors actually um, in line uh, with the wires themselves. And then I have two of these um, SparkFun SX uh, 1509s. Um, that uh, these are multiplexers that allow me to uh, they have 16 outputs each and so I'll have uh, 32 additional outputs so that I can control all these LEDs in all the different segments and then the other cool part at least for me is the actual paddle shifters themselves um, there's just a little automotive style uh, push button in there that's sunk into the back of the uh, wheel itself and it's got a fairly stiff spring, so it's actually a really satisfying feeling being able to pull these paddles and be able to shift through the gear. So that part I'm really excited about. If I haven't mentioned it already in a previous video, I don't have a background in electronics, engineering, or control systems, uh, but I am a hands-on learner. So part of this project, uh, the intrigue of it at least, uh, was to learn more about these topics. And the last couple of weeks, um, I've had a lot of learning opportunities, to be honest. When I started using the Arduino Nano to measure RPM um, with a photo interrupter, I was getting nice clean pulses from the photo interrupters with 
and able to just use some uh, generic tachometer code uh, from Google. Um, but then when I ported the code over to the ESP32, my RPM readings would randomly fluctuate several hundred RPM. Um, I don't currently own an oscilloscope, so it took uh, far too many days of investigation, but I actually discovered the uh, several extra pulses were being counted as the photosensor was changing state. So sensors actually will need uh, debouncing. So for those of you who don't know uh, or haven't heard that word before, uh, debouncing is when you have an input such as a sensor or a button that doesn't necessarily make a clean transition in state from say on or off, you know, or to high to low. Uh, this is really straightforward to deal with with a button in software or hardware if you know more about electronics. But with an RPM sensor, the time between pulses is much faster and keeps getting smaller as speed increases. So your debouncing has to be better tuned. To establish an upper bound for the time available, I worked out the time between pulses for the maximum RPM of the gearbox. So I figured uh, 2000 RPM maximum at the lay shaft and there's 12 pulses per revolution. I'm gonna show the math up there. Basically it comes out to 400 pulses per second or a pulse every 2.5 milliseconds. Um, I then measured the sensor state itself and the time elapsed in 100 microsecond or millionth of a second increments and discovered that it takes about 0.75 milliseconds uh, for the interrupt photo interrupters to change state reliably, which seems a bit high, but I'm gonna go with it. Um, this is just the way I came up to do with this. Uh, I know, I'm sure there's a better way to do this in hardware or some other uh, method that I'm not aware of, but uh, for now it seems to work. Armed with this information, I created a, a simple proportional speed control algorithm, which ended up working terribly. Um, the motor would slowly accelerate towards the target RPM and then begin oscillating out of control and fluctuating between zero and 2000 RPM. Um, I took to Google to do some additional research and stumbled upon the Arduino uh, PID library, um, which is actually built in, and which ends up being a much more comprehensive version of the controller I had initially tried to come up with. Um, if you don't know what PID controller is, um, there's a wealth of great YouTube videos out there on the topic and how to tune them. So I'd love to say the learning ended here, but the reality was that the PID was actually worse than my uh, homebrew control scheme. The gearbox just went back and forth between two, zero and 2000 RPM with some jerky steps in between. I spent a couple days playing with the PID values, but I could never seem to uh, tune it in right. For some reason, I tend to get unpredictable behavior from the uh, ESP32 servo library write, micro, write microseconds function when used in conduction with the uh, PID library. Uh, the, I can't put my finger on it exactly. Uh, the motor sometimes just buzzes and nothing happens when I can see the value being written in microseconds to the ESC should have the motor spinning quite fast. In fact, if I just hard code that value and perform the right microseconds uh, function, it, it works just fine. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to tune all those oscillations out or if they're just caused by the actual uh, hobby electronic speed controller that I've got. So I picked up one of the Cytron MD13Ss, which is uh, available on Amazon for like 20 bucks. And I think that they handle 10 amps continuous or actually 13 amps continuous and 30 amps uh, peak. If I can't get the uh, Hobby ESC working, I'm gonna go ahead and swap it out for this. If you're anything like me right now, you're thinking, wow, this was just supposed to be a, a simple paddle shifting gearbox model, right? Well, I found out nothing is as simple as it seems. Uh, I really do have a whole new level of respect for the engineers behind the uh, real Formula One gearboxes. I, I can't imagine thousands of hours of planning and design and testing you know, based on all the stuff that I've learned now, I do feel like it kind of makes sense to go back and tighten up my conceptual design and really try to lay out how all the functions of the gearbox work together in harmony so that I can uh, make sure that I don't miss anything. It has four primary functions. Um, the first is it needs to be a speed controller. So that has to be able to, you have to be able to set a target RPM and the gearbox rotates at that RPM. Um, it needs to be able to shift gears, which is honestly the most solid piece of functionality we have right now. And this is probably the most complex piece of it all is the actual vehicle simulation. It needs to uh, 
feel like a real F1 car. You know, I want to be able to have a throttle and um, up through the gears and be able to pull back on the actual paddles and watch the shift indicators, um, you know, go off for each gear. And to do that, you've got to really be able to kind of simulate the F1 car and the loads of the F1 going through the F1 car and essentially an approximation of what a real F1 car um, might feel like. You know, that's a pipe dream at this point. We'll figure it out um, as we go. And then the last function that the gearbox has to be able to do is it has to be able to publish and receive data um, to the remote. So the, the remote can display the RPM, what gear it's in, and then it can actually tell the gearbox, hey, upshift, downshift. If you enjoyed watching this video, uh, please go ahead and hit the like button. And uh, if you want to see more content like this, uh, please consider subscribing. Mm -hmm.